I think I decided to study with Henley because um, I was looking at a variety of business schools. I think what I firstly did was um, accept the challenge that I should immediately do my MBA after the PG dip. I could have waited another year, um, but then I felt if I wait another year, I, I might not do the MBA. And, um, you know, when I came across Henley Business School uh, out there in the main, and I looked at how Henley uh, marketed itself specifically um, around the triple accreditation of the MBA, um, that brought me closer to, to to understand what is actually happening at, at Henley Business School and um, also looked at other uh, former students of Henley Business School who are out there uh, in the public who are talking about the school and how great the school is, the networking is, uh, the support, the level of support the school gives um, the students. Um, and so I only spent like, I think two months after the PG dip and immediately went into the MBA um, not knowing what to expect, but being driven by the fact that uh, there's an opportunity to continuously to develop, um, the opportunity to continuously uh, stretch my mind, uh, which is one of my goals of doing the MBA in the first place, is the fact that I want to be introduced to new concepts, new ideas, uh, being able to turn them around, turn them upside down, try contextualize them. Um, in my environment, contextualize them to South Africa. Uh, for the MBA, as you know, it's standardized globally. Um, and so there is that challenge of thinking globally and acting locally. Um, and so that is uh, quite a phenomenal challenge to take those um, global ideas and concepts and begin to apply them. So how do you apply them um, in the South African context? And more specifically, how do you then apply them to your organization? Um, which is another challenge as well, which which is when the flexibility comes in to say um, your assignments are not standardized in the sense that they must look a certain way. You decide, um, do I want to do it based on my organization or I do it based on someone else's organization? So there is that latitude um, of seeing how well you apply concepts, how well you apply models. Um, that's what Henley is actually testing. Um, it's not just black and white type of approach to education. When I looked through the, the application and looked at how Henley interprets education, um, I kind of skipped that part. I read through it, but it didn't sink in how Henley approaches um, education. That you've got, uh, when you step into a Henley classroom, the first thing you notice is the round tables. Um, so the whole approach uh, fundamentally changes. It's, it's not about the lecturer sit, standing in front and pontificating from the front about whatever you are studying. But in fact, there's a lot of uh, 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 collaboration, forced collaboration uh, in the school. So you get in there, you must be part of a syndicate group uh, of uh, seven, eight, nine people, okay? People you don't know, people you now need to interact with. What stands out for me fundamentally is the education approach to, to the school and how it forces the student to come out of their shell. Doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert, you must have an opinion. What is your take, Monde, on the following? What do you think about this? How are you interacting? How are you interpreting what is happening? Because if you keep too, if you keep quiet for too long, people think you're disinterested and you're, you are detached from the group. So Henley forces you to, to recreate what's happening out there in the classroom setup and being forced to engage people you may not necessarily like, people may not necessarily understand, but you've got to come out and you've got to say, this is what I think, it's what I don't think, etc., etc. I was also pushed by other um, um, staff members at, at the school during the PG tip journey. Um, they would pop in there and they would say, guys, you've got to do your MBA, you know, you've got to keep going, you've got to, you know, you've got to move on. Because Henley wants all to succeed. If I want to become the leader I want to become, then education then becomes key, fundamental, um, pivotal um, in becoming that leader. And so if you stop lead, if you stop reading, you stop leading. If you stop growing, you stop uh, uh, leading. You know, if you stop studying, you stop having that ability to lead people and to lead initiatives and ideas into the future.
I love I love uh, concepts. Um, I love ideas. Studying the PGD and the and the MBA um, so far has has opened up um, the intellectual space for me. Um, the journals uh, that you're forced to to read, the case studies, um, you know, the the material, the content um, that is there. It really has enhanced my ability to express uh, myself. It has given me the confidence. Um, to say that I've got these abilities um, to really craft ideas, craft concepts, and turn ideas upside down like I have been doing in the organization, and also looking at um, how best the organization is implementing, you know, its its mandate as well. So I would engage extensively with with other, you know, internal stakeholders, so to speak. So it really has been beneficial for me um, to be a handy student, beneficial for me to take responsibility a step further to actually go through the, the content and the content keeps stretching um, the mind. There are other um, Henley students in, 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 in the office as well who are doing their PG dip and they're now beginning to see um, why I was ranting and raving about certain things when I was still doing the PG dip, you know. So now they're beginning to see, you know, the benefit of, 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 of being a Henley student. So Henley really has um, enhanced uh, my abilities and capabilities and I'm grateful for it. How would one, you know, give hope to to someone uh, in unemployment space? I mean, if you look at the statistics, um, they're quite bad. We only have, according to stats, I say, 14.1 million employed South Africans um, out of the 39 million uh, able to work South Africans. The 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 onus rests on the middle class. The onus rests on these black lobby groups uh, um, and other white lobby groups as well, uh, like your BUSA your BLSA, uh, your BMF, your BBC, etc. They are the middle class. They are an expression of what is possible in South Africa because they are alive with possibility. They are alive with influence. So speaking to unemployed people, it's not easy to just give them hope, you know, but the lobby groups themselves, the businesses themselves that are part of the middle strata have got responsibility, you know, to facilitate hope and the continuous connection of, of the middle class, of what is possible, um, and the masses, the poor masses um, of, 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 of our country. Um, so the Black Management Forum uh, began in 1976. And uh, as you would know, that, that was almost like the, the hype of uh, the apartheid government. And you had very few um, black managers and leaders out in business. And so they needed support. And they would get together, and the very few black leaders would get together and uh, discuss, you know, how do we support one another? Um, how do we, you know, grow? And so two things came out from 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 those meetings back in in the 70s was the fact that we need to develop black managers. Uh, we don't have many of them in South Africa, you know? and there will come a time where this will become a thing in the future where. We've got to focus on developing black people because they've been underdeveloped and underutilized by apartheid and colonialism. So affirmative action blueprint, which was developed by BMF, became the Employment Equity Act um, that we have today. Um, the whole drive for black economic empowerment, BMF, is the one that then came to the fore and said, let's have a, economic, um, uh, a black economic empowerment commission um, in 19, 1997. The BMF again then established uh, with other um, stakeholders the Black Business Council. Then the commission, the BE commission, which was chaired by the current president, Sil Ramaphosa, um, sat with the Black Business Council. Then, as you would know, in 2001, we had the first report um, of, of the BEE. And then after that, uh, the lobbying again of the Triple BE Act. And so I'm giving this, you know, this background to say the BMF is a creation of the social political environment and it is responding to the social political and economic environment by advocating for the development of of black people and black leaders and also making sure that there is space for them to to develop uh, in south african space and also challenging corporate south africa to transform not only challenging them to transform but also assisting them to transform and working together with them in the whole journey of transformation and then you come to my department which is uh, advocacy and thought leadership so thought leadership um, 
is is intensely about about moving the organization into a space where we are able to articulate our views um, on current affairs and what is happening, leading discussions, creating the content um, that the organization uses um, to to leverage on out there. So we write opinion pieces. And you've seen some of my opinion pieces out there, and um, and also then lobbying for those ideas. Um, so so that is the work of a thought leadership um, in, in in driving the thinking of the organization. You can almost say it is the engine of the BMF today, that the BMF is all about thought leadership, giving key insight into leadership and development in South Africa. There's a quite a number of, 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 of things that we're involved in, in terms of content development, in terms of positioning the thinking of the organization, and also advocating um, its views and advocating for its, for its progress. And that ultimately then leads to developing the people that build South Africa, that build Africa, because we're giving a South African and African-based perspective on leadership and management, um, which is contextual, and how that then that impacts um, South Africa. And we can see how BMF has impacted the leadership that we have, both black and white, in South Africa. And as much as South Africa is not growing as much as it should in terms of GDP at the moment, but the quality of leadership that has come out from the BMF to lead organizations out there, it's phenomenal. The kind of leaders BMF has produced over the years that have led enterprise, have come from the hands of the BMF. Um, and the organization then continues to lobby for, for, for those things. Policy as well. We're also involved in policy as well. Um, we lobby uh, continuously, watch what is happening in the policy space um, as well through research. So um, whether it be the, the procurement bill, which was out for, for public comment, we engaged there. So we engaged with the Employment Equity Commission, the triple B E uh, Commission. So we're actively involved in what's happening in the policy space and giving input um, in, that, in that space to, to ensure um, that we continuously are aligned to what South Africa should be achieving based on the constitution and the democratic principles that South Africa has pledged that we will pursue and pursuing justice, equity, and fairness in South Africa. Because you ask any successful black leader in South Africa, would you advise a young person to start a business or would you advise them to get an education? Without a doubt, all of them, the ones I've listened to, would say categorically, go and get a skill. But in actual fact, true education is about stretching and challenging your mind and being able to see beyond the textbook. And once you get into that space of seeing beyond the textbook, we are able to create things we never thought we could create before. So an MBA student in the future should be able to draw resources together, pull an HR person together, pull a marketing person together, pull an operations person together, and be able to build a business because they are seeing beyond what is possible and so it's important therefore that when we want to progress that we progress based on a very clear uh, human resource plan of, of the country broadly you need specialists you need specialists in the legal space when you've got the challenges you need someone who knows what they're talking about and in the legal space different kinds of, of professionals you move into the economic space you need guys who can forecast we need uh, 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 economists in the banking sector to understand interest rates and understand, et cetera, et cetera. So formal education is key to the development of the country because it promotes specialization, which is not a discussion we're having currently. People are just discussing education broadly. But if you were to uh, streamline it, um, you'd say, actually, how many specialists do we have in this field in South Africa? And there's a discussion now of a brain drain as well. We're having specialists leaving South Africa as we speak. Of course, an MBA is not necessarily giving a specific uh, uh, speciality, but it's giving you a general speciality. So people who study uh, MBA and DBA are business people who are able to put everyone together and build business and build leadership and managerial competence. Then there are others as well who are just finance people, for an example, but specialists in their field. So it is fundamental to any emerging market 
in across the world to begin to specialize to formalize education to grow um, the skills base of the country to have a proper skills audit of the country um, at the moment when you talk skills audit in the country we're not so sure of the numbers as well so research and development becomes paramount becomes key um, in unearthing those possibilities to say how we do in this space and when we do research and development it's through research and development where we can create and produce different goods and different services for the country but if there is no research and development and no investment into research and development like china and the east we will be left behind formalizing education specializing become a specialist if you are a generalist become a specialist who generalizes on things if you are not a generalist specialize in something so that you become an authority over your content Henley business school are pushing me continuously to come out of my shell and to continuously uh, find myself in how i interpret the the new content and what i make of it and um, so they're not out to catch you but they are out to to introduce you to yourself um so how best can monde be introduced to monde as he is introduced to this new world of um, academia and as i step into that uh, space i begin to see the infinite possibilities of what i can become the reality of who i am in the present in how i'm actually connecting with the content and and, and how my organization can see um the fruits of 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 being an mba student of being a henley student looking beyond um the the 1 plus 1 equals 2 but looking beyond of what can you create outside of that 1 plus 1 equals to 2 and 1 plus 1 then equals to building africa building the organization building the individual who then has the influence um in their personal space in order to self create and self propel uh, himself or herself into becoming a leader that south africa is looking for and that a leader south africa is longing for